first slide because you, you know that already. Uh, I want to talk today about uh, what are my educational goals. I would like to talk today about how foods and nutrients can alter your health other than providing nutrition. Some foods or food chemicals can treat or prevent major human diseases by altering your gene expression or altering your existing genetic polymorphisms. That agriculture and medicine can work together to promote health and prevent disease and to use food to alter your gene expression in a dose and time dependent manner to prevent disease. We know that we're not all genetically the same. We don't react the same to medicine or to foods. Not all foods are the same. Foods have changed over the last several thousand years. Here's, uh, we all know that uh, someone like Winston Churchill lived to be 90. He was British Prime Minister at 80. He was overweight. He drank heavily. He smoked cigars. And he never exercised and he didn't eat healthy and he lived a long life. Where Jim Fix, who really was the person who started the sport of running, he started Runner Magazine, and he advocated running, died of a heart attack at age 52. So we're all different. And we need to think about whatever we prescribe for the population uh, isn't necessarily right for any one person. So we need a personalized approach. Chronic disease accounts for 75% of all healthcare expenditures worldwide. Chronic disease costs trillions, it's almost two trillion in the US. It's at least double or triple worldwide. There's two factors, those which are modifiable, things that you have control over, such as your diet, lifestyle, exercise, alcohol, tobacco, foods and chemicals, and things you cannot modify. Not yet. You cannot modify your age, your sex, or your genotype, or your family history. But we can say now that many chronic diseases can be prevented with changes that you can modify through your modifiable choices. Here's a picture of a caterpillar and a butterfly. And you all know that all the genes in the caterpillar are present in the butterfly. And all the genes in the butterfly were present in the caterpillar. So you could say that they're genetically identical, but phenotypically different. Their genotype is shared, their phenotype is different. Sometimes the leg genes are turned on, sometimes the wing genes are turned on. So this is an example of genetic regulation. Some, some factor has caused this metamorphosis to occur, turning some genes on and turning some genes off. Well, many of our food chemicals can turn our genes on and off as well. When we look at this first panel on this slide, you see, or I see, citrus. Not all citrus is the same. Some is green, orange, yellow. Do they all have the same chemicals? Are they expressing different genes? Do they all have the same health benefit? Then we have legumes. Are legumes the same? Soybeans from a thousand years ago have vastly different gene profiles than soybeans that are used in mass production today. Are these tomatoes all equally healthy? Red tomatoes, purple tomatoes, uh, are they, do they taste the same? Do they have the same healthful chemicals? I don't think so. Are these tomatoes all equally healthy? This is a tomato that's had its gene for producing red carotenoid altered versus a green tomato. If you eat them, are you going to get the same benefits? Does it depend on your genotype? Look at these carrots. Are they different? Is the purple carrot going to provide you the same anthocyanin that the white carrot's going to provide? Are they going to provide the same to every one of you because each of you are different? Are some of these expressed just like the butterfly and the caterpillar? Are some genes turned on and some genes turned off? Are they equally healthy? Do they grow the same? Do they taste the same? Why do we choose different color foods? Nutrigenomics is the science that tries to provide a molecular understanding how dietary chemicals affect our health. 
DNA is not your destiny. When I was growing, going to school, and maybe you, we thought that DNA was destiny, that your genome told all. But that's not true. Your genome changes. Identical twins get different diseases because of their epigenome. You can now eat to regulate your genes, but also it appears that we regulate the genes of our children and our grandchildren. And in some species of animals, like the water flea, Daphnia, certain toxins in water can have effect for five, six, or seven generations. So we have to be careful what you eat, and it can be passed from the mother or the father. Here's a picture. You've probably all seen this before. How many people have seen this picture before? Not everybody. This is, a, this is 10 years old from Duke University. Randy Jertle published a, an article on, these are genetically identical mice, born of genetically identical mothers. The mother of the yellow mouse was fed a normal mouse diet. And the mother of the brown mouse, this is called an agouti mouse, was fed a diet rich in methylating groups. S-adenosyl, methionine, B12, folic acid, betaine, and genistein from soy, things that acetylate the DNA. The DNA from the brown mouse is heavily methylated. The DNA from the yellow mouse is demethylated. The yellow mouse lives a short life and has cancer and diabetes, and the brown mouse lives a long life and has, never gets cancer or autoimmune disease. How can that be if they're genetically identical? And all the dietary changes can occur within the first 48 hours of conception. When you look at how the experiment was done, the yellow mouse was divided into two groups. Some of them were fed diets supplemented with compounds rich in methyl donor groups, like folic acid. And most of the offspring were brown agouti mice that lived a long life whereas half the animals were fed a common regular mouse food diet, and they mainly produced yellow offspring that were obese and lived a short life and had multiple diseases. And when you look at the genome, the yellow mouse was, this is methylation of the DNA, and methyl groups added to DNA, and the brown mouse has nearly all the major organs in the body heavily methylated, and the methylation lasts throughout the lifetime. And it even extends into the second generation. And we know it's true in people because we can see a disease called spina bifida, or sometimes categorized as neural tube defects, can be largely prevented with supplementing the maternal diet with folic acid. And if you look at when we started supplementing maternal diets in, in uh, uh, I can't see that in, uh, in the in early 1990s, and you can see the incidence of neural tube defects and anencephaly declined dramatically as we supplemented certain food groups with methyl donor groups and acetylating groups. So we can actually modify the human genome through diet by causing methylation of the human genome, or sometimes called acetylation. And we know that many of our foods will do this. We have foods that will acetylate and when you acetylate, you gene activate. When you deacetylate, you gene repress, similar to methylation and demethylation. But the foods that you know of are green tea, soybeans, garlic, tomato, watercress, turmeric, cabbage, red grape. So you can actually dial a genome, just like the caterpillar and the butterfly, you can tune your certain genes on or off by the foods you eat and when you eat them. Do you eat them like, if you take ibuprofen, you have to take it three times a day. But food chemicals have half-lives too. So some foods you need to take three times a day. When I go to Japan, I eat soy in my miso soup three times a day. And in the US, I have it five times a year. And starvation. We all know the experiment done in, both in World War II and in China in 1960. So 1944, we had mass starvation in, in the Netherlands in 1944, followed 50 years later by mass obesity, diabetes, heart disease, 
in children born of mothers who were starving in 1944. We saw the same thing in China during the famine of 1959 to 1961. We saw a, a huge incidence of obesity 30, 40, 50 years later in children born of mothers who were pregnant at the time of the famine. In addition, we have babies born during famines have doubled the risk of schizophrenia and some other mental illnesses. So we are modifying the genome by all the chemicals I told you, but by obesity, we can hypermethylate DNA, and we can also do it with starvation. So we have multiple tools. Sometimes we apply them indiscriminately and not voluntarily. But what if we could actually control them voluntarily? Here's a picture of a rat that's been given vitamin A on day eight of pregnancy. Vitamin A has caused the homeotic oxygen one through four to become turned on in cells that usually have those genes turned off. Well, the homeotic oxygen one through four are responsible for spinal cord formation and body patterning. So if those genes are turned on at the wrong time, they're normally off. But if you give vitamin A and turn them on, you get malformations. So you can sometimes cause malformations within an extremely tight window. When in the developing fetus we have certain tissues develop, we can interrupt them with some dietary modification. This is not such an easy picture to look at, but we have the parental diet, the maternal diet, the prenatal diet, the diet around birth. Some diets are very important within the first 1,000 days of life. Micronutrients, methyl donor groups, uh, uh, nutrients. And sometimes the adverse effects will not appear for 30 or 40 years. In the current obesity epidemic that's affecting one billion people, are we going to see an adverse effect 40 years? But it starts in the <coughs> oviduct fluid. When the zygote is transitioning down the oviduct, it's exposed to bacterial infections, cytokines, amino acid, glucose, growth factors, temperature, and mechanical effects. And when the oocyte is uh, provisioning itself with, it's exposed to dietary fat through different lipid droplet sizes and compositions depending on what the mother eats. Lipids and sugars can alter mitochondria. Micronutrients can impact DNA and certain dietary chemicals, chemicals from plastics. Fetuses can develop their taste by 15 or 16 weeks old. We know that fetuses begin to respond to flavors in the amniotic fluid. We know that they smack their lips when the amniotic fluid is exposed to sugar, and they can smell by things that are in the amniotic fluid, and we know that they can develop a bitter taste and cause a grimace on their face when they're exposed to bitter chemicals. And we know that later in life, children can, can children Babies born with caloric-deprived mothers have li lifetime risks of obesity, cardiovascular, and type 2 diabetes. And here we have a picture of a baby that rejects a flavor, while another exposed to a flavor in utero, utero accepts it. So we see that taste and taste preference can be determined in utero, sometimes within the first zygote or oocyte stages of development. Here's a picture of a baby bottle and a plastic water bottle, and you've read in the last five years about the worry, it's a real worry, about bisphenol A and tributylene, chemicals used in plasticizers. They've been no shown to cause uh, alterations of the epigenome and be an environmental toxicant that alters your genome. Michael Skinner was wildly criticized when he published the paper that injection of mothers of mice or rats with bisphenol A, you could see differentiated methylated regions for three generations. So my daughter had a baby 
10 years ago and she used baby bottles with bisphenol A. Did she program my grandchildren for a multi-generational effect? Here's an experiment done with bisphenol A that the more bisphenol A that you give to the mother, the more the offspring look yellow. Remember the yellow and the brown mouse in the beginning? So if you give the mothers bisphenol A in different groups of mothers, we can get yellow coat and they get obese. You can see it's larger and they get autoimmune disease and cancer. But if you give the mice, the mothers, <laughs> sorry, I'm innocent. If you, give, if you give certain foods like genistein, you can reverse the effect. It isn't just the mothers, the fathers too. The father's spermatozoa and DNA can be imprinted during development uh, in maturation in the epididymis by the same dietary chemicals. So it, it isn't blame the mother. Both mother and father can confer lifetime and multi-generational effects. Here's uh, the experiment that's been very well published on mothers that lick their offspring. So a pup that's raised by an anxious, low nurturing mother becomes an anxious adult. A pup that's raised by a relaxed, high nurturing mother becomes a relaxed rat. So we have a psychological effect of nurturing that can cause differentially methylated regions of the genome. But if you give take a relaxed, nurtured rat and inject methyl groups, you can turn a relaxed rat into an anxious rat. And we see that during diet, during early development can have lifelong lasting effects. And sometimes multi-generational. Identical twins. We can do studies of methylation. We can do, you know, look at these chromosome banding experiments. The twins, when they're, when they're born, they're identical. But later in life, sometimes you see one twin get arthritis, and they get different diseases. So, and you can see that, maybe it's hard to see, but you can see on the chromosomes differences in identical twins that occur as they age. So many of the diseases that twins get are diet and lifestyle. Uh, that are caused by changes in the epigenome. So we keep in mind that it isn't, I just, I should actually show a father next to this mother. It isn't just the mother, but we have environmental factors, dietary factors, things that affect you, your husband or wife or spouse, your fetus, and you're also in affecting the second and third generations. Epigenome effects are multi-generational. Now, a large majority of the differentiated methylated regions are eliminated during reproduction, but many of them in certain regions of the DNA are not, and they can be translated for multiple generations. So what I tried to talk to you today as I end my talk, that foods or nutrients can affect our health by mechanisms other than providing simple <coughs> nutrients or energy. Some foods or food products can treat or prevent major human disease by altering gene expression through existing genetic polymorphisms. Remember the different tomato, the different carrot, the different soybean? You can take them once a day. Soybean genistine has a half-life of 12 hours. So if you eat it the way we eat it in the US, which is once a month, you're going to have a different outcome than if you live in China or Japan, where you have it three times a day. Or if you drink green tea every day, as opposed to drink coffee every day or Diet Coke. They have vastly different chemical compositions and likely different chemical outcomes, and particularly on different genetic polymorphisms. And this is where we can bring agriculture as a partner with medicine, because I think in the future we can produce genetically engineered crops that don't just increase yield, but can 
cause methyl donor groups or deacetylating chemicals or acetylating chemicals that can alter or turn on and off. So if you remember one thing from my talk, remember the butterfly and the caterpillar are genetically identical, but sometimes different genes are expressed. We are like that. Sometimes our genes are expressed, the bad ones or the good ones, depending on what we eat, when we ate it, whether our mother ate it, our father ate it, or our grandfather ate it, or our grandmother ate it. Foods can alter or complement gene expression in a dose and time dependent manner. So we start to think about food like you take drugs. Chemicals in food have half-lives area under the plasma concentration curve. They have dose and time effects. And we can study their genetic, their epigenetic effect through the way they wind up DNA and unwind DNA and methylate and acetylate and deacetylate. So we can dial our genomes in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>